Welcome. It's great to see you all here in the Mandela Auditorium in the FedEx Global Education Center. Thank you all for joining us to celebrate the 15th anniversary of this wonderful building. To mark this occasion, I'm thrilled to host our special guest this evening, founder and chairman of the FedEx Corporation, Frederick W. Smith. Before we hear from Mr. Smith, though, the Chancellor has joined us to kick off this celebration. And the fact that he's here won't surprise any of you who've heard him speak about his aspiration for our beloved Carolina to be the leading global public research university. I must say, and I say this with profound gratitude, that Kevin has never once since I arrived at Carolina more than three years ago, wavered in his support for our shared vision of infusing this campus with a global mindset or his commitment to the global guarantee, our promise to offer every Carolina student a transformative global education. It's such an honor to welcome to the podium neuroscientist, MacArthur genius, keen and distinguished professor and the 12th chancellor of the University of North Carolina, Kevin Guskowitz. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Barbara, and uh, welcome to the 15th anniversary of our incredible uh, FedEx Global Education Center. We are so proud of, of, of it, and we're so thankful that you're here joining us this evening. Uh, since the center uh, opened its doors 15 years ago, uh, we took a giant leap forward in becoming the leading global public research university in the nation. And uh, the center really centralized our global work and became a a bustling center of international activity that we are very proud of. Uh, hundreds of students, faculty and visitors pass through daily to attend classes, public lectures, uh, and to meet and collaborate with colleagues across campus and with partners around the world. Uh, I shared with uh, our speaker this evening, as I had a chance to spend some time with him in my office earlier today, that so often we talk about uh, the people making the difference, that it's the people that, um, that you know, that, that shine and uh, the people that we're proud of. And, uh, and I talk about that often, that it's rarely about the building or the facility. I think that this facility, this building uh, may be the exception because I think it is about both the building and the people because of the way in which it draws incredible talent into the building um, for the magical things that happen here. It's the first place to welcome uh, arriving new international students and scholars, uh, and it's where Carolina students plan their first journey outside the United States. The FedEx Global Education Center is unique because it brings together three major components of an international education. Student and faculty services, academic instruction, and research. All of that happens here in a very synergistic way. Uh, I've been a faculty member here at Carolina for 27 years, and I've witnessed the incredible growth of our global program. And we're a we are different today than we were 15 years ago, and we're much better because of this amazing facility. And as I've, as I've already said, uh, the incredible people that are drawn to it. Uh, as we look to the future, we are positioned to tackle the global challenges of our time because of the community that, that resides here. Our culture of collaboration is unlike any other. I talk often about those low stone walls that define our physical space of our campus, but I think it also describes the culture of collaboration that exists here. We don't work in silos at Carolina. That's not who we are. And that's why it's great uh, to be together to celebrate the hard work and investment of so many people this evening. Many of you here tonight were early supporters and helped to make this building a reality, and I want to take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of the university. And I want to also take this opportunity to thank tonight's keynote speaker, Fred Smith uh, and FedEx for your visionary support of the building. I really enjoyed our time earlier today. Uh, as you all know, Fred is a global leader who understands the importance of education in preparing the next generation of leaders. And he's going to talk with us today about some of the most uh, prescient issues of our time. And uh, Fred, I'm just grateful for your commitment uh, and, and to this university. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Sam for being here, a, a Tar Hill class of 2008, 2008. She's one of three uh, of uh, Fred's children who are, are Tar Hills. 
and uh, we're grateful for, for your support of your alma mater as well. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Barbara Stevenson uh, to, to formally introduce uh, tonight's keynote speaker, Fred Smith, and we are in for a real treat, I promise you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. What a history we have in this space and what a joy to gather with so many of you who have been fundamental to its success as a hub for global activity and collaboration. The FedEx Global Education Center is a powerful symbol of Carolina's commitment to global education. And it's one of the things that drew me to Carolina after my first visit to campus. How do you know Carolina is really committed to being a leading global public research university? The existence of this building speaks volumes. This beautiful space has created a home for global education on the Carolina campus, and it has accelerated UNC's success in ensuring that all Tar Heels have access to a global education. So there's no better person to have here to mark this occasion than Fred Smith. For starters, he is the reason this building bears its name, the FedEx Global Education Center, or as it is more, more colloquially known across campus, FedEx or the FedEx building. <laughs> His generous gift saw it through to completion. Another reason there's no one better than Fred Smith to be with us to mark this occasion, the message he bears. He comes to us as a global business leader and Tar Heel dad to share his insights and make the case for keeping our world open. How? By re-engaging on the trade agreements that give us the rules of the road and the airways. Tonight's talk falls under the new diplomatic discussion series, which is itself part of UNC's new diplomacy initiative. Fred Smith has been known to refer to himself as a diplomat, and as a diplomat myself, I'm honored to share that moniker with him. To lead FedEx requires real global knowledge about the regions and countries of the world and the systems that connect regions and underpin global trade. It also requires skills useful in diplomacy like critical analysis, collaborative problem solving, persuasive communication, and informed decision making. Skills that Carolina is helping students develop so they can become the next generation of global leaders and solve the grand challenges of our time. And one of the things that Carolina's Diplomacy Initiative does, but rarely so well as tonight, is provide opportunities for students to hear from global leaders, leaders like Fred Smith. Building on Carolina's standout strengths in area and language studies, students can complement their knowledge base with the skills needed to solve problems with a global perspective. The grand challenges of our time are increasingly inherently global in nature. That's why students benefit so much from hearing firsthand from leaders who have risen to such challenges and succeeded. In the pilot year of the Diplomacy Initiative, we've not only seen students build out their knowledge and develop their skills, we're also seeing them develop confidence and begin to see themselves in these roles and recognize that they are indeed on their way to becoming the next generation of global leaders. I'm grateful, Mr. Smith, that you accepted our invitation to come to Carolina for this special occasion. You're an example for our students and for the Carolina community of what it means to be a global leader. Fred Smith has used his position at the helm of FedEx to shed light on issues like climate change and sustainability and the importance of trade to the global economy and to reducing poverty around the world. I've had the pleasure of discussing some of these issues with Fred and after he shares his remarks this evening, I'll join him on the stage for a conversation. I'll ask questions, he'll answer them. It'll be great. <laughs> Fred Smith not only founded the FedEx Corporation, but he created an entire industry that changed the way the world works. Under his leadership, FedEx has become a $93 billion global enterprise that serves more than 220 countries and territories and has an amazing number of airplanes and buses and trucks. During his career, he's been instrumental in securing significant regulatory reform for the aviation and trucking industries. Fred also continues to shape critical policy issues for his industry, 
including advocating for a more sustainable future by investing in carbon capture research, electric vehicles, and other innovative solutions for the transportation industry. Under Fred's leadership, FedEx has been recognized many times as one of the best companies to work for, and it is consistently named among the world's most admired brands. It's a real honor to have Fred Smith with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming FedEx founder and executive chairman, Fred Smith. So thank you very much, Ambassador Stevenson, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Chancellor, for inviting me here tonight. It's always good to be back in Chapel Hill, one of my most uh, fond places on the earth. As was mentioned, I've spent a lot of time and not an inconsiderable amount of money here over the years. I have, because I have, as was mentioned, three children that are graduates, Arthur Smith, class of 2005, Rachel Smith, class of 2006, and Samantha Smith Atkinson, class of 2008. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is one of the finest public institutions in the country. I think quite frankly, and I say it unabashedly, it's number one among all public universities. And I'm familiar with all of them. The institution's commitment to research, service, and global learning opportunities is quite frankly unmatched. And this global education center, which we were proud to give to the university truly serves as a hub of understanding where a diverse community can learn and help further the university's mission, both domestically and abroad. So again, it's my honor to be in your company this evening. And my mission as I understand it, Chancellor, is to pass on observations and learnings from my life and career that may be helpful to people associated with the university uh, and in your future pursuits. Before I sit down with Ambassador Stevenson for a more in-depth conversation, I'd like to speak to you about the importance of global trade. FedEx was a creature of the computer revolution that began in World War II. Due to the introduction of the first silicon transistor in 1960, automated devices based on computational capabilities exploded during that decade. And they have continued to increase exponentially in power, according to Gordon Moore's law that was first posited in 1965. In the early 1960s, unlike today, most of America's technology companies were based in New England, with then famous computer companies like Sperry, Univac, RCA, Burroughs, and IBM introducing new products in a seemingly endless stream. Most of these companies, with a few notable exceptions like IBM, are lost to history, given the brutal Darwinian competition in the technology sector. These new computers in those days and their users, such as banks, aircraft and avionics manufacturers, armament companies, and medical and diagnostic equipment suppliers constantly needed urgent parts, whether for repair or production. They needed the parts transported quickly and directly given <clears throat> the dire consequences of machine outages since traditional manual tasks were increasingly done by computers. Attending college in New England and as a charter pilot in those days of these urgent parts led me to believe that a new demand pull logistics system would have to be created for new technology based products versus the traditional supply push distribution system for traditional items like lumber, agriculture or consumer items. After I left the service in 1970, these trends were even more pronounced and the need was accelerating, which led in April 1973 to the inauguration of an integrated air ground system operating a hub and spokes network that allowed overnight shipping of these high technology and high value added products in an unprecedented way from any point to any point 
absolutely positively overnight, as our famous advertising proclaimed. Demand for the services of FedEx exploded and FedEx aircraft quickly became dubbed the, computer, the clipper ships of the computer age. This is an especially apt description as we followed the tech manufacturing diaspora around the globe, particularly in Asia among the four tigers, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. And then in the 1990s to and from China, which had embraced market economics in 1979. Our role in the emergence of China was as illustrated by the board of directors being welcomed by President Jiang Zemin in his office in 1997, something I don't think a Western company would possibly do today. The largest driver of demand, even in 2022, for our Global Express operations are semiconductor-based products, although many other high-value-added products like tens of millions of COVID vaccines, which we were proud to deliver, all sorts of other medical devices and medicines, proprietary designer goods and aviation and mobile machinery parts also pulse through our networks in the 220 countries and territories we serve. The slide over my shoulder details the size and scale of FedEx when in our major operating companies, FedEx Express, FedEx Ground and FedEx Freight. While I won't read to you each of these numbers, you'll note we've come a long way since that first night of operations in April 73, when FedEx shipped 189 packages. As this slide shows today, FedEx ships an average of 14.5 million packages and pallets, thanks to the efforts of more than 700,000 team members around the world, giving us a very unique and bird's eye view of the trends affecting global commerce. Our unmatched worldwide network serves more than, as Ambassador Stevenson noted, 220 countries and territories. In fact, every place in the world that's not uh, prohibited by the United States government, of which I think there are now five. These 220 countries and territories comprise more than 99% of the world's gross domestic product. The engine that drives it all is global trade and our team members sit on the front lines of the connected global economy that quite frankly, we take for granted these days. It's from this vantage point that FedEx observes the benefits of global trade every day as we connect people with possibilities around the world. The door-to-door -door trade flowing through the FedEx international networks has truly changed the way the world works. For as long as human history recalls, goods have been moving around the world. Records from almost 4,000 years ago attest to the existence of an Assyrian merchant colony in Cappadocia, the modern territory of Turkey. 3,000 years ago, Arabian nomads domesticated camels and embarked on a long distance journey to trade in spices and silk with the Far East. Developments in shipbuilding and navigation enabled the Egyptian spice trade in the Red Sea, consequently broadening the horizons to India and Yemen and creating new routes to Asia. And today we can cross an ocean in a few hours in the air, giving you the ability to place an order with a European company on your phone, have it fulfilled in Europe and delivered to your home in the US in 24 to 48 hours door to door. Economic benefits of Free and fair trade have demonstrated throughout history the benefits. History shows trade made easy, affordable, and fast always begets more trade, more jobs, and more prosperity. Trade is also central to combating global poverty. Countries with open trading systems or border measures that facilitate trade grow faster and provide higher incomes and more opportunities to their populations. Trade is the lifeblood of the global economy. The United States has long recognized the benefits associated with trade. Tariffs and non-tariff barriers raise costs and inhibit trade for customers, particularly those of the express transportation industry. Trade agreements reduce barriers and increase our ability to offer services outside of the US through investment and competitive safeguards. They also reduce tariffs and streamline border clearance processes, which lower costs for US customers. 
This in turn enhances their ability to engage in international commerce. Now, until recently, the policy of the United States has been the promotion of global trade. It was President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his Secretary of State, Tennessee and Cordell Hull, that pushed through the Reciprocal Trade Agreement of 1934, largely to offset the terrible consequences of the protectionist Smoot-Hawley legislation of 1930, which is universally agreed now to have been a major cause or accelerant of the Great Depression that precipitated the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. After World War II, Hull strongly supported liberalized trade along with the establishment of the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. He tried unsuccessfully to establish an international trade organization. Afterwards, the U.S. persisted with nine rounds of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, and these negotiations took place over 50 years, gradually opening through a series of liberalizing agreements or rounds, as they were called, until the World Trade Organization, the WTO, was finally established in 1995's fulfilling Hull's vision. This included our major World War II adversaries, Japan and Germany, with fantastic results for humankind's prosperity and lifespans in the second half of the 20th century. America's embrace of open trade in some cases, some cases knowingly one-sided against U.S. business interests to advance the Western cause against the USSR and China during the Cold War allowed American consumers to increase their standards of living substantially, with a typical family benefiting by over $10,000 a year by the start of the 21st century due to the importation of low-cost goods. In this respect, there is no question China's reluctance to move on Taiwan, which it covets at least as much as Russia does Ukraine, is based on, one, its enormous trade of export manufacturers with Europe and the United States versus Russia's largely commodities-based economy underpinned on the oil and gas. And the second reason China has been reluctant to move on Taiwan is its dependence on seaborne imported oil and other com uh, imported commodities for its economic success. With the rise of populist politics, American leadership for open trade is now in jeopardy. In the 2016 presidential race, Secretary Clinton turned against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, a trade treaty largely designed to thwart China's growing mercantilism. In this, she joined soon-to-be President Trump, who scuttled the TPP on his very first day in office, even though the provisions of TPP later formed the basis of the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, that replaced NAFTA. Trade offers America the best opportunity for soft diplomacy and for the export of American values. Protectionism is isolating. Abandoned trading partners or scorned allies will turn to other economies to fill the void the U.S. has left, which is China's strategy with its Belt and Road Initiative. This places American companies at a disadvantage in the short and the long term. For example, the abandoned Trans-Pacific Partnership included the most robust, enforceable environmental commitments of any trade agreement in history, and it sought to put an end to child labor. It was a means of bolstering the U.S. economy and the presence and influence in the Asia-Pacific region, including democratic reforms without depending on military action. By leaving the Trans-Pacific Partnership, other countries in Asia have been given ample time and space to advance their own economic interest in the region. I'd like to share several facts that counter the false anti-trade narrative that's very popular these days. As I stated earlier, trade bolsters our economy. In the U.S. expansion of trade between 1950 and 2016 generated annual and recurring income gains of about $2.1 trillion. This translates to an $18,000 increase in the income of American households, mostly because of more affordable imported consumer goods. In 2017, the, world was, the U.S. was the world's largest goods and services trading nation, with exports of goods and services totaling $2.35 trillion. 
More than 21 million net American jobs depend on imports. According to a 2018 report from the Urban Institute, job losses in recent decades came not from free trade, but from increased productivity, which increases, increasingly requires advanced technology, but relatively less labor. The economic reality is that jobs are constantly being created and replaced as economic activities expand, technology evolves, and sectors grow and shrink based on countless market forces. Number three, global trade benefits go both ways. It's about the bilateral flow of goods and services and investments. Stressing exports to the expense of acknowledging the benefits of imports is counterproductive. Imported components enhance exports, and this is the natural benefit of diverse global supply chain. In the same vein, promoting foreign investment into the U.S. while deriding U.S. investment abroad is to quote a retired foreign service employee clapping for investment with just one hand. More than 95% of consumers live outside of the United States and investment abroad generates new revenues and new jobs here at home. Those who think the U.S. can manufacture all the goods we require to maintain and improve our standard living are quite frankly engaged in sophistry. We do not have the population, the workforce, or the culture to do so. We have the ability to succeed in the trade of services, increasingly digital, and high-tech and high-value added manufacturers. The United States has fought six significant wars over ideology, oil, or both since World War II. But in reality, they end up being one and the same. The defense of open Western values, including open trade, has been the right course, however imperfectly executed by our country. The U.S. should support its support, should maintain its support for a rules-based trading system. This works to combat unfair trade practices abroad and protects U.S. intellectual property, as well as sustaining our economy and strengthening national security. Instead of withdrawing from trade agreement negotiations, the U.S. should fully engage to ensure that trade rules meaningfully address unfair trade practices that harm American interests and pursue robust enforcement of those rules. The administration should focus on expanding U.S. services exports to new markets abroad, working to eliminate foreign barriers to trade in services and digitally in Able trade could increase U.S. services exports by over $800 billion to $1.4 trillion, creating as many as 3 million new high-paying jobs in the United States. And finally, we should continue to ensure secure and diverse supply chains. In February, President Biden signed an executive order on America's supply chains calling on U.S. companies to help inform a resilient, diverse, and secure supply chain that ensures economic prosperity and national security. There he made clear that a resilient supply chain is secure and diverse. It is important then that U.S. companies active in or relying on the global supply chain stress that an efficient, safe, and secure supply chain is not one built on the complete offshoring of manufacturing production for the U.S. economy. In fact, terms like nearshoring or friendshoring are counterproductive in the drive to create the best supply chain for any given sector. Despite economic cycles, conflict, and shifting demographics, humans have demonstrated for millennia an innate desire to travel and trade. In this regard, I strongly agree with Cordell Hull's sentiments in his memoirs to quote, to me, unhampered trade dovetails with peace. High tariffs, trade barriers, an unfair economic competition with war. I believe the record is clear, clear. The U.S. should trade what it can trade with willing partners, restrict what should not be traded due to risk to our national security. The U.S. should embrace its history as a leader in the creation of the modern global trading system. That system has been good for the United States and the world, maintaining peace and stability and creating economic opportunity. I hope my observations tonight have provided you with some insights on this strategic issue, and I'm pleased to answer your questions with Ambassador Stevenson. Thank you.
Good luck and go Heels. Thank you. Well, that was terrific. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let's go back to the early days of FedEx. And let's go back even earlier than that to your days as a student at Yale when you wrote a paper proposing FedEx and it was not well received. Can you just, <laughs> you ran into skepticism and doubt that the business could work. Can you share about your entrepreneurial journey and how your original vision has evolved to meet the changing demands in a global market? Maybe even a comment or two about your professors at Yale who were so short sighted Well, <laughs> first of all, let me um, thank you for not expressing that the way it normally is that I got a C on my paper. We would never mention that. <laughs> but um, you should know that uh, a C was a really good grade for me and I was <laughs> happy to get it. But all kidding aside, as I <clears throat> sort of explained in the talk, the story is a bit uh, uh, apocryphal because the way I came to this conclusion was flying these parts. And I, I, I'd learned to fly when I was 15. And uh, when I was in New Haven, um, I flew mostly people, but I would be called on to fly these parts from Rochester to Pittsburgh or Hanscom Field outside Boston, which was a hotbed of technology in those days to Washington, D.C. or whatever the case may be. Because if you bought an IBM 360 in the early part of the 1960s to get rid of your clerks at the bank, mm -hmm. And the, and the computer went down, <clears throat> you couldn't do the debits and the credits. So it was a catastrophe for you, the user, and it was a point of viability of the manufacturer to be able to, to, to supply those parts. So IBM <clears throat> could tell you very uh, accurately uh, how many of a particular part on an IBM 360 would be needed on any given day, given the universe of computers installed. They just couldn't tell you which one. And Douglas could tell you very accurately how many flapjack actuators or jack actuators were needed for a DC-8 airplane, but they just didn't, couldn't tell you which one of them and where it would be when you needed it. So uh, that's what I was talking about. Society was beginning to automate. Now, everybody's got a, everybody's got a, a, a cell phone or an apple or whatever you and raise your hand so <laughs> you, your entire life is automated now i mean we all lose our cell phones sam almost every other week but <laughs> um, <laughs> and 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 you're out of business so that's that's what that bank was like in 63 <clears throat> all your rolodex doesn't exist anymore all your institutional knowledge your your private data which used to be in in file cabinets or wherever you kept it is now in an automated device in your pocket, which is I also said in the talk is an order input device. So you can take that phone and you can look at the wares of the world and with one or two strokes, you can order it and have it, have it delivered. In fact, if you look at the growth of e-commerce from 2008, it was like a Polaris missile. Well, that's because of mobile telephony. So that's the connection between what I was seeing in the early 1960s and today. So the paper really wasn't about FedEx, which is the apocryphal part of it. And you're one of the few audiences that I tell the, the real story about. I just usually lean into it and say, yeah, I got a grade, which was good for me. I went into the service for four years. And the military in those days in the main was a supply push system, just like lumber. So lumber, you, the forestry company would cut the trees down, send it to the sawmill, make two by fours, four by eights, whatever the case may be. The wholesaler would come in, put it into their lumber yards, the contractor would come and buy it, the supply push. They couldn't tell you who needed the two by fours and 
Charlotte or Raleigh Durham. They just knew that on average, X number of two by fours were. Well, the military is the ultimate example of that in the main traditionally bullets, beans, and blankets. You just push them forward. And finally, you get down to the, to the company or the battalion level, and they pull them out of the storage, and they consume them. But by that time, the military was becoming <clears throat> much more automated. Um, the battleships and the cruisers offshore of Vietnam had computerized gun systems, and some of the fighter planes had you know, exotic radars and so forth. So everything that I had seen in its nascent form in the early 60s by the early 70s. So I did three separate, <clears throat> had three separate uh, marketing studies done that verified the need for what we were going to do. My service in the Marine Corps, I served in both air and uh, ground and air units. And uh, so having trucks and planes together was not unusual for me. And the way to do it was uh, essentially modeled on the bank clearinghouse. It was a hub and spokes. Yeah. Because if you try to connect 100 points together, point to point, it's 100 times 99. It's 9,900 connections. If you do it through a hub and spoke system, it's, it's only 99. So it's fantastically more efficient to connect many points through a hub and spokes rather than directly. But... Normally, people find that hard if you take the individual transaction versus the whole transaction. You mean you're sending something from Minneapolis to Detroit over a hub in the middle part of the United States? I don't understand that. But when if you take all connections, just like a bank clearinghouse, it's very efficient. So that's what led to FedEx. It took off. The demand was so huge. We were like Pogo the possum that finally, that famously said, if you want to be a great leader, find a big parade and run in front of it. And that's what we did. <laughs> and um, the, only, the only problem we had uh, was in 1973, the Arab shut the oil off with the Arab and boil barter. So the federal government uh, put in uh, allocation controls, which were based on your previous allegation. It was a real problem for us. Our allocations were zero. So that's when I became a diplomat. Right. So I had to go to Washington and convince John Sawhill, bless his soul, that we were deserving of an exception to this rule. We got the fuel. It delayed our profitability about 18 months. It cost us dearly. And uh, that's why I have such a low regard for the Saudis, and, <laughs> among other reasons. And so uh, the for doing that and uh, a few other things here lately. But... So that, that was a big problem for us. But otherwise, as I said, as the high-tech revolution took place, the manufacturing, for the same reasons it's mostly in Asia today, you know, moved out of the United States. It moved out of Boston, and it moved uh, overseas. And, of course, it, it made Asia rich, mainly. Uh, there were more other commodities and so forth, like uh, clothing and so forth. But it was really those electronics-based trades and then automobile that made Asia and Europe uh, rich. So that's the actual story, but you have to take a little time to, to understand both the belief that society was going to automate and then how we came up with the solution. And the name Federal Express came from my study of the Federal Reserve System, which had in microcosm the same requirement to move things between its banks and branches. And uh, so I, I used it as a sort of a surrogate for the U.S. economy writ large. And that's where the name came from. Somebody had already used American Express anyway. So. As that is not the explanation you'll find elsewhere. That was no. much better. That no, well, I saved that for places like uh, the UNC, where there are <laughs> erudite people that are actually interested in the in the subject. That's great. I'm going to switch gears to sustainability because I know it's important to you personally yeah. and to FedEx. And you've talked to Congress about it. And earlier this summer, FedEx announced the ambitious goal of achieving carbon neutral global operations by 2040. Mm -hmm. So how do you make the case that a sustainable business is not just good for our planet and our society, but also good for business? Well, one thing, Barbara, is that today's consumers, particularly the younger consumer, they're just not going to do business with you unless you're uh, in environmentally responsible. I mean, we just see that in every possible 
um, interaction with our customers, whether it's individuals or the biggest corporations in the world. So even if you didn't believe it philosophically or scientifically, you would be crazy not to be um, responsible in that regard. So that's one thing. Second, we're a transportation company. We use a lot of fossil fuels. I think, you know, a billion, 700 million gallons per year. So we're one of the companies that makes money by doing the right thing, because if we can use less fuel, then it, it, it's good for us. Now, you can talk yourself into doing things that are on the margin, not very sensible, but we just did a deal with General Motors, um, I think it was a year and a half ago, to buy their new uh, Bright Drop. It, they set up a separate subsidiary that makes pickup and delivery vehicles that are electric. And the best application for EVs is not personal automobiles or big trucks. It's locally charged pickup and delivery vehicles like FedEx, the Postal Service, the mm -hmm. bread vans, whatever the case may be. So we're going to go all electric in our vehicles by 2035. These are fantastic. And they have a positive profit accretion and a high ROI. The buildings are getting more and more, um, you know, powered by renewables and so forth, although we are a very strong advocate of a readoption of nuclear power. We can get into that if you want to. Yeah. The biggest problem we have is aviation because there is really no solution. And as you probably know, we funded a major initiative at Yale, my alma mater, and the, the relation was only because Yale has got a venerable forestry school that evolved over time into the Yale School of the Environment. And um, so I went up there a couple of years ago and, and uh, talked to the, to the president of, of Yale and the provost who's a distinguished scientist himself, and most importantly, Dr. Ingrid Burke, Indy Burke, and said, do you think you could solve this problem? to naturally sequester enough carbon to offset the two and a half, three percent of total carbon emissions emitted by aviation. So they set up the Yale uh, Center for Natural Carbon Capture, um, arboreal, agricultural capture, but more importantly, the most promising is through geological and uh, be able to strike uh, certain formations of of rock and have it absorb permanently. I mean, for millions of years, the carbon emitted by aviation. So they're doing important work. Boeing and Southwest has joined us and contributed to it. And uh, I'm, I'm optimistic about what they're, what they're doing. So we've been very um, forceful in this field because we think it's our public responsibility. It's because what our customers want and uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's inspiring. You've already talked about needing to be a diplomat back in that Arab oil embargo in 1973. So um, can you share a little bit about what your diplomatic skills look like and how they've served you in your career? And then I'm going to ask you about the next generation. Well, uh, I hope I have diplomatic skills at the right point in time, but I know from you, who is very forthright, and I know about your career, being a diplomat does not mean being disingenuous or untruthful. In fact, some of the times it means telling very hard truths. Yep. Um, but I think the word diplomat is um, is a is a very important. Uh, attribute to anybody that runs a major corporation, certainly one that's involved internationally, because you have to be respectful of other people's views. You have to listen to people. You know, you certainly can't be the old time uh, ugly American, you know, that knows it all. And uh, so I, I take that as a point of pride. If people think that I'm, I'm diplomatic at time, you might get a, you might get a, disagreement on that in certain circles, including in my family. <laughs> it took me, I didn't find out until, until about 10 years ago that all my kids, and I've got a lot of them, call me Stalin behind my back. <laughs> I like to think of one characteristic of diplomats is they're effective in getting things done. Well, no question way. about that okay. in your case. I agree with that. That's a good way to put it. There we go. So, so if you're going to operate in 220 countries around the world, our biggest hub in 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 uh, in Europe is in Charles de Gaulle, and and uh, the French are are famously difficult sometimes, and 
but I'm a Francophile and we have a wonderful relationship there. We just opened up a big expansion of that hub and we just had our board meeting there in July. Our equivalent um, in Asia is Guangzhou. And where people are amazed that an American company has a huge hub inside China proper, but we operate there every day. But as you saw with Zhang Jimin, I mean, we've been there a long time. And when we brought our board to his office at his request, I started talking about the history of FedEx. And he said, you don't have to tell me about FedEx. I know all about FedEx. He said, it was one of the companies that made the modern world. And he proceeded to give a lecture to, the, to our board of directors. Yeah. As an aside, for people who don't know it, he, was, he had a terrific voice and he loved Elvis Presley and he sang Elvis songs. <laughs> Love me so he was in it. Was it? Well, he sang that one and uh, uh, he sang them all. He sang them all. So, There's very well. Pretty wonderful. Yeah. Now, what about new hires at FedEx? Um, <clears throat> you've got one Carolina alumna mm -hmm. doing a, a hell of a job at government relations, but are there any skill sets that we at universities might pay more attention to? Well, I, I think that. Um, our organization is um, to some degree emblematic of society as a whole yeah. because we have tens and tens of thousands of the brightest IT people, artificial intelligence, machine learning, marketing specialists, lawyers, meteorologists, you name it, <clears throat> of the white collar trade. Mm -hmm. But we also employ hundreds of thousands of blue collar people. And uh, so we know a lot about both. Yep. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people that can't play basketball like Michael Jordan. I mean, in fact, I think the pyramid's pretty small. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the top. So the same thing is true about humanity. I mean, certain people can do certain things and other people excel at one thing or another. So the first thing you have to recognize is that human history is mostly the story of innovation and invention and entrepreneurship driven by a very small group of people. Um, most of the history is from the big man theory. I've always liked the annals theory, you know, about seeing what society was doing from the, from the bottom up. Uh, there was a great scholar of the, of the trade in the Mediterranean, Fernand Brodel, who wrote the annals school. You see what's happening. So, I think you also have to look at society as a whole and say, how do you also take care of the other people that are not going to be Michael Jordan or uh, a scientist or, or a doctor or much less a MacArthur genius, for God's sake. So, <laughs> but you never know who, who that's going to be. I, I'll, 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 bet you, I'll bet you that that when Michael Jordan was recruited here, they didn't know he was going to be Michael Jordan, right? But he, he turned out to be Michael Jordan. I bet that when, when the chancellor was doing his studies, nobody knew that he was gonna revolutionize this whole study of, of concussions and everything, but there, there he did it. So the main thing is to provide great education and look for that, look for that individual that's gonna, gonna change the world. And, um, and I think our system of higher education in, in the United States is the best in the world. And, it, and there are others that, sort of brag about it. And I don't think China's is, is up to our standards because they're too uh, centralized. They're too, they try to make it too standardized. And of course, Germany with all their famous universities made a huge mistake, uh, in my opinion, in the latter part of the 20th century, trying to take those differences of those great universities and get make them more standardized and more equal where it's the diversity of Carnegie Mellon and the UNC and Caltech and, uh, you know, Washington and all that. So I think we've got to continue to put the support that we have over the years in our system of higher educational for those white collar folks. And then I think down in the blue collar uh, area, we have to recognize we got some real problems there. I mean, we have a whole group of people that have decided they're not going to work anymore. And uh, work is now optional in the United States. And that's the reason you have inflation today is because we don't have enough workers to do what the, what the economy wants, wants out of the goods and services. And until that equals, we're going to continue to have interest rates going up and inflation going up. 
partnership. I want to return to your comments about trading with willing partners. Mm -hmm. As someone who worked on those free trade agreements throughout most of my career as an American diplomat, I can't help but lament how public opinion has turned. Yes, so and that's what I was trying to get across in my, my talk is because of all this populism, which is now on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. people aren't looking at things rationally and they got this dollop of, of anti China, China uh, stole all the jobs. Uh, and certainly there was some of that, but as I tried to point out in my talk, it was long before China came on the scene. It was really the emergence of the technology industries and the four tigers in Asia that began it. China just brought a huge labor force in there. But North Carolina is the perfect state to talk about trade because you remember the 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 wonderful um furniture industry that was yeah. here everybody laments that over at hickory they don't have the furniture uh factories anymore and down in greenville south carolina which is sort of the center of the um textile industry in the united states they're not anymore we'll go back and pull up you may not remember this a movie called norma ray and it's a you know about this lady that works at a textile mill well Nobody's going to pay $42 for a t-shirt. I'm sorry. They just won't. So that business moved away and it moved away because people in the United States were becoming wealthier and they didn't want to do that kind of work. That's why I said that people think that we can re uh, bring the, the, uh, the, the entire supply chain for low value added items back in the United States. We don't have the culture. We don't have the workforce. And if, and if that worked, Brazil would be the United States today. And as uh, one of the statesmen in World War I famously said, Brazil is the country of the future and it always will be, you know? And, and it's because of protectionism. They can't stop doing it. And there's just an example after example after example how you, how you make yourself poorer with, uh, with uh, you know protectionism or mercantilism, one of my famous economists of all, uh, my favorite economists is uh, Frederick Bastiat, who in 1830 famously posited he was a French guy, and they had the same they had the same arguments today. Exports are great, imports are bad. So he came up with a solution to the problem. He said, "We're going to build the biggest shipbuilding industry you've ever seen in France." We're going to manufacture everything that we can think of. We're going to put it on those ships. We're going to sail them five miles offshore. We're going to sink every one of them. That was his solution. <laughs> so as much as I think about this. that. So you, you, you have to trade with willing partners. Exactly. And, and uh, so if you, if you have one, uh, if you have an entity the way China is today, well, I want to sell you everything but I'm gonna increasingly build stuff in my country and that's Frederick Bastiat. And so you have to get people that understand that trade is a not a zero sum solution, which is the way the politicians put it today, that it is a, it is a, a system of, of uh, taking advantage of everyone's skills and capabilities or choice. I mean, Paul Krugman, uh, the, the left wing, uh, economist from uh, the New York Times, he famously won, a, won a, a Nobel Prize because he showed it's really great that you, if you're an airline, you can buy Boeing and Airbus. You know, you got choice because one keeps the price of the other down. One of them innovates here, one of them innovates there and so forth. And everybody prior to that time had been looking sort of at competitive advantage. You know, I make wine, you make leather, let's trade. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Ricardo, I think, was the economist that came up with that idea. But in any case, you have to have willing partners, just like you have to have willing partners to do business in Chapel Hill. I mean, you go to a restaurant, you go there because you want the food, and you have a willing transaction. So we have to we have to get back to that. And as I tried to say in the talk, we're the ones who we're the ones who did that from Hull and Roosevelt on, and. Um, uh, people also forget the moment that uh, Hitler became uh, a national figure was when he 
railed against the depression and what was coming. Yeah. And uh, that's what put them, put the Nazis in the position they were. And of course, then he became chancellor and then Fuhrer and all that sort of thing. It was economic. And it was the depression, which was largely fueled over protectionism. So we're kind of heading the same way today. And uh, hopefully it doesn't have the same results, but these are big themes. They're not just sort of arcane things that you talk about on the campaign field. They're sort of the glue that binds humanity together. Fred, I knew when you came tonight that you would explain not only the importance of this issue, but the urgency of it. Oh, very and I urgent. am so grateful to you for laying it out so clearly. We're running out of time, though, so we're going to have to wrap this up. And um, let's all join me in thanking Fred Smith for coming here tonight and calling us to action. <laughs>